Hello, and welcome today to this brand new episode of His Story, Christ in America, episode 2. Now, I know it's only the second episode, but instead of going through all the different religions, all the different beliefs that existed here and what we now know as the United States of America, I decided to go ahead and skip forward a little bit to the settlement that we now know and that was known back then as Jamestown. I'm sure we've all heard about Jamestown. We've all heard about Captain John Smith who literally saved Jamestown. I'm sure that a lot of us have known that history. We know that story. But did you know that in reality you can say that it was God who saved Jamestown? Did you know that John Smith, that even though he may not have been saved, he very likely was not saved and not know God, but yet he had respect of God. Did you know any of that? And if you didn't, even if you did, stay tuned. Stay on my channel. Stay on this video and keep watching for more of this episode of His Story, Christ in America. The 13 colonies, they eventually grew into the United States of America. See, originally, we weren't the United States. We originally, we were just 13 colonies. 13 British colonies. Now, of course, if you're from Florida, somewhere like that, somewhere up north, or maybe originally the land that you live in was owned by the French. Maybe originally it was owned by the Spanish. You know, it really just depends on where you're from. But the government of the United States of America originated in the 13 colonies. And the first permanent English colony and this United States of America, and the colonies, the original English colonies, was known as Jamestown. You know, as I said earlier, I'm sure we've all heard of Jamestown. I'm sure we've all heard of the story of Jamestown and about how John Smith sailed it. But do you really know the story? Do you really know the story about how John Smith saved Jamestown? Well, the whole story starts on December 20th, 1606. Think about that. December 20th, 1606, almost 410 years ago. 410 years ago. Three ships left London, England. These three ships, they were known as the Discovery, the Susan Constant, and the Godspeed. They left London, England to start up a new colony in the land known as Virginia. John Smith was among these men there. Him and his 12-year-old page were on the ship. There were 105 men on the ship, only men, and they were going to start this new colony for England. You know, we hear about the pilgrims and about how they came to America for religious freedom, right? They came so they could worship God. For Jamestown, it was different. The men came because they were looking for gold. They came because they were looking for adventure. They came because they expected riches. They came for all many different reasons, but it really wasn't religious freedom. For the most part, they were just looking for gold. And by religious freedom, what I mean when I say that is the freedom to worship however you want to. To worship however you desire. That was something that wasn't present in England. In England, you were pretty much required to be a part of the Church of England. And let me just say this. The Church of England, I believe it also known as the Anglicans, um, is pretty much, in terms of doctrine, in terms of ceremony, rituals, almost the same as the Roman Catholic Church except it is a uh, Protestant, um, I suppose you could call it a denomination, the Church of England. It was the Church of the Nation of England. I mean, it's that simple. The name says it. And you were required to be a part of the Church of England. And in fact, the first um, that we know of, at least, uh, the first uh, church service that took place in the 13 colonies was done by a minister from the Church of England. An Anglican minister. And these men who they came to Jamestown, most of them are from the Church of England. Well, why was that? Because in their country, you were required to be from the Church of England. So, you know, the Church of England, they really didn't believe everything like they should. They didn't really believe the Bible like they should have. But that was probably all that most of these men knew. But anyhow, they came along and during the voyage, which may I remind you started about 410 years ago. During this voyage, some of the passengers, they claimed that John Smith, this man who had boarded the ship, they claimed that he had attempted mutiny against Captain Christopher Newport, who was the captain of the ship Susan Constant. And mutiny, of course, that's basically trying to 
in simple terms, you're basically trying to overthrow the captain. Basically, you know, when you get mad, when you're at sea and you're a sailor, and there are people who could explain mutiny much better than I could. But basically, you're just trying to overthrow the captain, lock up the captain. And some of the passengers, they said, oh, John Smith, look at John Smith. He, he attempted to mutiny. He tried to, Captain Christopher Newport, he tried to lock you up. And Newport put John Smith in chains. You know, I'm not saying that John Smith didn't attempt mutiny. But the fact is that there wasn't suitable evidence. But the fact is this is all he knew to do. John Smith could be trouble. John Smith could have stopped them from reaching Jamestown. So all that Newport knew to do was to put him in chains. They arrived at what is now known as Cape Henry in April of 1607. And once they arrived there, Newport opened the documents that had been sealed that he personally had not even seen yet. They were from the Virginia Company. The Virginia Company was the organization that sent people to Virginia. He opened these documents from the Virginia Company, and it gave a list of all the new leaders of Jamestown. On that list was, of course, Christopher Newport, obviously, since he was the captain of the Susan Constant. Also, what he found on the list was Edward Maria Wingfield, Mar Bartholomew Gosnell, George Kendall, John Morton, George Percy, John Ratcliffe, and no other than John Smith. That's why this fiery, red-headed man with a short temper who was accused of attempting mutiny. Did he really do it or not? We, we really don't know to this day, but he was accused of doing something so terrible. The Virginia Company declared him one of the leaders, one of the most powerful men in this new colony of Jamestown. John Smith was to be one of their leaders. Now, of course, Newport understood this. He looked on the list. He saw John Smith. He knew it was John Smith. But still, he was kind of uncomfortable with John Smith because he didn't know what John Smith would try to attempt. You know, he didn't know what's John Smith going to do next. So he kept the chains on him. He still kept the chains on him. But since the Virginia Company... And I, it may sound like I'm just talking a bunch of facts to you, but please bear with me. Since the Virginia Company wanted John Smith to be one of the leaders of Jamestown, he didn't kill him. See, John Smith probably would have been hung for attempting mutiny. But he decided not to do it because he knew that apparently for some reason or another, he didn't know why, but he knew that John Smith had something about him that mattered to the Virginia Company. Because for some reason, the Virginia Company had made him one of their leaders. Did he free John Smith Mio? Did he say, fine, I'll take off your chains? No. But he said, you know what? I'm not going to kill you. Because there's something about you that the Virginia Company thinks makes you a suitable leader. He didn't know what that was, and maybe he never even found out. But he did not kill John Smith, a man who may have even been innocent. On May 14th of 1607, just a little bit after they had arrived, Edward Maria Ringfield who became the president of the council that ruled Jamestown. So in other words, basically the president of Jamestown, Edward Maria Ringfield. He was basically above all the other leaders. And he found the place that Jamestown would be at. He was the leader in deciding where Jamestown should be. Now the area that Wingfield chose was swampy and had many mosquitoes that carried deadly diseases. In fact, these mosquitoes would kill 60 out of the original, out of the 104 passengers who survived the voyage, by September, 60 people would be killed by these mosquitoes. To say the least, Wingfield was not very wise. The place that he thought would be great for a new colony, it ended up being a place just simply swampy, hot, the heat, a muggy area, humid. Now, I don't know how many of you live in the South, but I do, and I know what it's like to feel hot and humid summers, and they arrived, think about this, they arrived at Jamestown just in time for summer, just in time for summer, and they had to go through the hot, muggy, muggy, I mean, muggy and humid summer with mosquitoes killing them, Kill, killed 60 of them, killed by diseases from mosquitoes. And the colony, all the people there, all the men there, see, these were grown men. These were grown and strong men who were supposed to be able, who were supposed to be able to fend for themselves. But guess what? They were lazy. 
and they were determined to not work. They wouldn't work for their food. They expected other people to bring them. You know, they wanted to be treated like princes and kings. They wanted for someone else to bring them their food. They wanted for someone else to give clothes to them. They wanted for someone else to make sure they had enough water to live throughout the week. They wanted for someone else to do it. They were lazy and they would not work. Instead, they spent their time looking for gold. I guess where well, there wasn't any gold. In actuality, they probably would have looked like nutcases running around on the beaches, picking up sand. Is there any gold here? Is there any gold here? Looking in the swamps, is there any gold? They were too busy searching for gold to even work for food. And things got bad. Things got really bad because the men were too lazy to work for food. Eventually, people started to get sickly because of lack of nutrition. They found themselves, many of them, dying from sicknesses because they wouldn't eat. They were too busy looking for gold. And John Smith was the only one of the leaders who had been appointed by the Virginia Company. Listen, let me say this. Wingfield didn't do this. Wingfield was the one who decided they should go basically live in the swamps. In fact, part of the diseases that came could really be blamed on Wingfield as it was his idea to choose a swampy, muggy location to start Jamestown. But John Smith, who had once been accused of mutiny, called a meeting. He declared this, He who does not work shall not eat. It became a law, a law in Jamestown. He who does not work shall not eat eat. In other words, you pitch in. You help with the chores. Know what I mean? You you help with the crops. You go hunting with the rest of us. You work. You work to make Jamestown a better place. You work, and you're going to eat. But see, these men, they didn't want to work. You know, they just want to sit down and, ah, hey, John Smith, can you go, you want to get something for me? You want to get something for me to eat? Uh, have you worked today? Nah, nah, I, I, I just wanted to look for some gold. I spent the day looking for gold. That's what was going on. And John Smith knew that it wasn't helping them any. People were dying from this. People were dying from their laziness. Because the fact is, with so few people who were actually willing to work, they didn't have enough food. They weren't able to make enough crops. They weren't able to find enough game while they were hunting. With so few people working, so little food came in. Think about this. They weren't working for money. These few men, John Smith was one of them. John Smith was one of the hardest workers in Jamestown. These few men who were actually willing to work, they hardly even brought in enough food for themselves, let alone for the entire colony. So that's why John Smith said, He who does not work shall not eat. In other words, you have to do something. you got to help out, and you'll get food. Now you may say, okay, so what's all this have to do with Jesus Christ? What's all this have to do with his story, Christ in America? What? I don't get it. Well, let me read you a Bible scripture. It's from the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. This is Paul speaking to the um, church, the church of Thessalonians. And he's saying here, For even when we, that's referring to him and those with him, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you. That if any would not work, neither should he eat. See, John Smith's command, it wasn't just some crazy thing he came up with. It wasn't just something that made no sense at all. You know, it wasn't just some law that came out of his mind. That came right from the Bible. John Smith's command came right from the Bible. Here's a fact. His plan of that comes from the Bible, that you must work to receive food, in other words, capitalism, because capitalism says that you've got to work for your own money. So uh, basically a form of capitalism. His capital, capitalistic plan, he didn't come up with it on his own. John Smith wasn't the Karl Marx of capitalism. He didn't come up with this idea in his head. He didn't write a book about it. No, he got it from the book. Amen. He got it from the book. He got it from the Bible. That's how he came up with this plan. It's a biblical plan, a Christian plan. And let me say this. Capitalism is of God, I believe. Communism is not of God. Socialism is not of God. You know why? Because that's saying, I don't have to work. The government will give it to me. Or this person who's richer than me, he's going to give it to me. Listen, God doesn't want us living off of other people. 
He doesn't want us dependent upon other people. And we know this because God led Paul to say that if any would not work, neither should he eat. In other words, work for your money. Work for your food. Be willing to be a hard worker. You know, there are very few hard workers these days. A lot of people, they want to get on welfare. They want to get on disability. And if you're on disability, I'm not saying that's the wrong thing. But what I'm saying is that there's very few people who are willing to get out and work for their food. They're willing to get out and work for their food. And guess what? Those the same people who don't want to work, they can work, but they don't want to work, are the same people who nearly led Jamestown to destruction. But look who saved Jamestown. Someone who was accused of doing so many wrong things. Someone with really not the best reputation, a bad reputation. You know, and even to say, some people think that John Smith was a liar because some of the stuff he said in his different books and, you know, oh, he just made up this about him and Pocahontas. He made up all the stuff about the Indians. You know, and I'm not saying John Smith was saved. I'm not saying John Smith truly knew Jesus Christ. I don't know. But I know this. Until John Smith came to America, there was no respect of God. The Native Americans didn't respect God. The Spanish didn't respect the true God. In fact, there were Roman Catholics. You can hear me talk more about that in my last episode. The French, I mean, the until John Smith came, and basically took a Bible verse and made a law out of it. And not a law as in a law to go to heaven, but a law as in something just to to keep law and order, you know? To keep, to keep people saved, to keep people alive. It's because of John Smith that Jamestown was saved. That perhaps without John Smith, we wouldn't have capitalism in the United States. In fact, perhaps we wouldn't have the United States. Because maybe Jamestown would have failed. Maybe everyone in Jamestown would have died. And maybe England. England was the country who sent out Jamestown. Maybe England would have just given up. And if England had given up, maybe France would have taken over. Maybe what we know is the USA Today would be a part of France. I don't know. But I know that without John Smith respecting God, without John Smith looking to the Bible for advice, he didn't look to Edward Maria Ringfield for advice or Wingfield. He didn't look to Newport for advice. He looked to the Bible. We need leaders like that today in America who will look to the Bible for advice. Who will look to the Bible for every problem. That's what I encourage you to do. Look to the Bible. Be like our founding fathers and look to the Bible. Look to the Bible for advice. And I promise you, the Bible will not fail you. The Bible has not failed America. In fact, if not for the Bible, America probably wouldn't exist. Stick to the Bible like John Smith tried to, like John Smith attempted to. Stick to the Bible, and I promise you, God will bless you and prosper, and you will prosper. God will bless you, and you will prosper, just like Jamestown was blessed, and Jamestown prospered. Thank you for watching this episode of His Story, Christ in America. And next episode, prepare to hear us talk more about how Jesus Christ came into America. So let me tell you this. People want to say this isn't a Christian nation, but you can tell it is. You know why? Because one of the first laws made to this nation came directly from the Bible, came directly from the Word of God. And you, you can always go to the Word of God for anything and everything that you need. Mm -hmm.